we're glad that you are here with us this morning. And uh, you've, uh, you've entered in at a time where we've been going through Paul's letter, the first letter to the Corinthians. Uh, we call it Letters to Sin City, the first two letters, simply because Corinth was kind of this crazy place in the ancient world. And, and uh, Paul writes these letters to deal with a lot of issues that were going on there. But he also answers a series of questions. And for the last uh, three weeks, We've actually been looking at some issues surrounding um, the whole concept of spiritual gifts. They were having problems there in Corinth with uh, just how that all was uh, working itself out. And uh, so Paul writes and says, I don't want you to be, literally the word is ignorant, uh, but it simply meant without knowledge. It didn't carry quite the baggage maybe that it does today. And, uh, and what he does here in Corinthians is he really writes what is probably the most extensive passage in the New Testament on this concept. Um, last week, I attempted a 21-point message and failed, uh, as all of you know. I made it through seven of the, uh, the first gifts, and I'm going to try and make it through the rest this morning. I'm hoping we'll move a little faster than I did last week. So uh, just to kind of get going, let, let me... Uh, uh, begin by, and by the way, we're going to focus, we're still kind of looking at the spiritual gifts. Next week, we'll try and uh, figure out, you know, some ways how you can begin to discover if you don't know, well, what are my gifts and how do I discover that? So that'll be what we'll, uh, we'll move into the third question next week. But for now, Paul writes this, now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. By the way, you know, as we go through this, remember uh, this is all about Jesus, too. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the life that Christ calls us to, first of all, begins when we open our life to Him, and Christ comes and by His Spirit dwells in us. And that's always our first step on this journey with Jesus. And, uh, but when He comes and dwells in us, a couple of things happen. One is we become a part of something called the body of Christ. It's a, it's a very real thing, the body of Christ, and we become individual members of it. And in that context, Christ in us wants to express himself in love to the other members of the body and also really to the whole world. And part of the way that Christ in us lives through us and expresses himself is through spiritual gifts. So that when we exercise our spiritual gifts, we're really uh, allowing, you know, uh, the indwelling Christ to minister to those around us. So again, it's all about Jesus. And in Corinthians now, he lists, you know, this gives us this list of the variety of different spiritual gifts. One of three primary passages, we'll continue to look at that. So for each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there's given through the Spirit a word of wisdom, uh, to another, a word of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, discernment of spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. Now, you are the body of Christ. And each of you is a part of of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helps, of administration, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret but eagerly desire the greater gifts. Last week, uh, when we looked at these first seven gifts, uh, these were the Romans gifts, and this kind of breaks down for you where you find these, uh, these lists of the different uh, gifts. It is interesting, by the way, Romans, Corinthians, Ephesians, all written by Paul. So e- even though the, the lists are different, it's the same Paul is kind of in, in each of those specific situations enumerating specific kinds of gifts. And then just a very short uh, one sentence in First Peter chapter 4, 
Peter only really talks about two gifts, uh, serving and teaching. Um, but uh, in these lists, some people, again, have, have taken the Romans' gifts and kind of looked at them as perhaps uh, sort of our primary gifting, that perhaps each of us, this would be our, our uh, primary mode of operation. And so we, we spent a, quite a bit of time last week looking at these seven, but just to remember, the seven gifts out of Romans are prophecy, uh, service, teaching, whoop, here we go, teaching, uh, exhortation or encouragement, giving, leadership, and mercy. And so, again, my sense is that we should be asking ourselves the question, which of these would be the primary way that I've been gifted, again, to function within the body of Christ? The second passage that we're going to look at, it comes from Corinthians chapter 12. And sometimes here in chapter 12, these are referred to as the manifestation gifts. And primarily because uh, in the text, uh, it tells us that, uh, that to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. And there are 10 gifts listed here in uh, Corinthians. And by the way, some of these are the ones that are a little bit disputed and debatable in terms of what we looked at a couple of weeks ago, certain you know, theological systems that would say those gifts are no longer given, others that would say, yes, they are given, and as a matter of fact, they're not only given, but you really need to have some of these. So um, I'll try and point that out as we move along. The first two really kind of go together here, and uh, in the text, uh, we're told that, uh, that one of the gifts is called a word of wisdom. And uh, the, the idea here is that the Holy Spirit, as we're interacting and, you know, together in the body of Christ, in certain situations, will we'll give a, a God-given insight into a situation. And normally, the wisdom piece of that, and again, I think wisdom and knowledge tend to go together, but the wisdom piece of that usually is that, that, uh, that wisdom will have some sort of a, an action or a strategy to approach some kind of a problem that's going on, and God will speak. And, you know, uh, I think sometimes these gifts are exercised without us even knowing it, uh, where the Lord is at work in our life and we're engaged with one another, perhaps sharing in life and, and somebody is struggling with a situation and, and God will lay on our heart something that we feel like needs to be spoken to them, uh, either and not simply by way of encouragement, but perhaps to give them sort of a, a perspective on what's going on and oftentimes with uh, some sort of a, an approach, how should I deal with this? Oftentimes, I think it, the two go together, a word of knowledge, and knowledge tends to be God, a God-given uh, insight that someone is given, um, and primarily sort of information-oriented. Uh, it's interesting, by the way, these first two words that Paul uses here. Uh, he's speaking into a situation where, uh, where the church is actually also struggling with what's going on in the culture around it. And, and in the culture of Corinth, one of the, the big issues were what were called the mystery religions. And in the mystery religion, salvation was actually identified as uh, being something that was achieved through knowledge. And the exact same word that would be used within that uh, uh, pagan culture in terms of uh, the route to salvation in, in these false systems, Paul kind of takes that and now puts a twist on it and says that really a, a real word of knowledge or a real word of wisdom will come to us from God's Holy Spirit as Christ dwells in us. And so again, I think that what can happen is that God can reveal to us uh, certain kinds of information that we can share with one another or speak a word of knowledge. And then oftentimes along with that will come a, an approach or the wisdom to deal with what that word of knowledge has said. Now, in the early church, by the way, uh, and, and in chapter 14, 
It was a lot different dynamic that goes on than what we're used to, uh, where, again, kind of on a Sunday morning, one or two of us are sharing or speaking. But it, it looks like when you look at what Paul talks about, there was a lot more interaction in the worship experience of the early church. And so, you know, as people were gathered together and praying and then, uh, you know, studying the teaching of the apostles, insights would be given to different people within the body and they would speak out and share those either again in a word of wisdom or word of knowledge. I also think these gifts are often manifested when a prophet is, uh, you know, prophet is speaking, uh, a teacher is teaching, uh, oftentimes that as they are uh, exercising those gifts, God will give that person an insight that then he communicates either through his role as a prophet or as a teacher. And even though those are the primary gifts, these two oftentimes, I think, uh, operate. You, you, you experience this sometimes, by the way. It's always funny, uh, not funny, it's always kind of fun when someone comes up after, you know, I, if I've given, you know, a, a teaching and someone comes up and says, how did you know that? And I'll be like, well, what, what do you mean? And they'll say, well, how did you know that was exactly what was going on in my life and that was exactly what I needed to hear? Well, obviously, I don't know what's going on in all of your lives. Uh, and, and oftentimes, I'm oblivious that, you know, that what is being spoken, I trust that what's being spoken and taught will minister to you. But sometimes that's coming across to you and it's like God speaks to you specifically into what's going on in your situation. I think one of the, uh, and by the way, these would be two of the gifts that if you are a cessationist, and again, if you're visiting, this would be a theological system that says at the end of the first century, some of these gifts were not given. These would be two of the gifts that most that uh, are cessationists would identify because the thinking is that when these gifts were operating in the first century, we didn't have the New Testament yet. I mean, the letters were being written. They hadn't been compiled yet. But that, again, in the mind of, uh, of a cessationist, uh, the scriptures now fill the role that these specific gifts would have filled. And if you're not, if you are a continuationist, uh, and believe that all the gifts are still given, which would be our position here, um, then, uh, then even though we have the scripture, there are times when God will use someone to speak to us into a very specific uh, situation. A good illustration of it is found, by the way, in uh, Acts. Um, and this is, uh, Paul is getting ready now to, uh, to go to Jerusalem. It's a, you know, the third missionary journey is over. He's heading back to Jerusalem. And on his way back, he comes uh, to Caesarea. Uh, and, and there in Caesarea, he stays at the house of one of the original seven deacons, Philip. Notice how many gifts, by the way, are mentioned just in this passage. Okay, so uh, we reached the house of Philip the Evangelist. Now, evangelist, the evangelist uh, is one of four gifts that are mentioned with the equipping gifts in Ephesians chapter 4. So there's a spiritual gift. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. There's the gift of prophecy going on. Not necessarily that they were prophets, but that they prophesied. They, they had that ability, that gifting. And then we're told this, after we'd been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming over to us, he took Paul's belt tied his own hands and feet with it and said, the Holy Spirit says in this way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. Now he's a prophet. So in, in one sense, he's speaking forth what God has revealed to him. But what he's speaking forth is a word of knowledge. He, you get this? He is revealing to them something the human intellect could not know on its own. And he's telling, here's the information. If you go to Jerusalem, this is what is going to happen. Now notice, I think this is kind of fascinating. Luke is writing this. He's there. And he says this, when we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Now part of what strikes me in the text is, Paul goes to Jerusalem because what is being said here is not a word of wisdom. If it had been from the Holy Spirit and a word of wisdom, someone might have said one of two things to him. The word of wisdom might have said, you know, okay, this is going to happen. And, and the Lord is speaking and saying to you, don't go. 
My hunch is, had that happened, Paul would not have gone to Jerusalem. But that, that wasn't God's plan here. There's not really a word of wisdom given. You know, everybody's real concerned for Paul. Oh, don't do it, don't do it. But the reality is Paul was supposed to do it. And, and part of God's you know, plan was that he was going to be arrested in Jerusalem and end up in Rome, obviously. The other thing that could have happened is that a word of wisdom could have been given uh, where someone would have said, you know, I believe that the Lord is saying to me to say to you, you're still supposed to go. Even though this is going to happen, you are supposed to go. That would have been sort of an approach to this information that would have, that's given here in, in a supernatural kind of a way. So an illustration of how some of these dynamics worked there in the early church. Then uh, he goes on, and, and the next gift that he talks about is a gift of faith. Uh, you know, we're all called to have faith, but the gift of faith is sort of an, an extraordinary confidence uh, that God is about to act in some specific situation or need, and the person that has the gift of faith, they just have confidence that, that when God has shown them, he's going to do something regardless of what the circumstances look like around them. They just believe God is going to come through. And again, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a touch of the Spirit on our life, and you need people with faith around you. You know, all of these gifts have this great way of balancing because, you know, um, uh, you, you know, if you, those of you that have uh, sat on the elder board um, know that we have got to make a lot of decisions. And sometimes, you know, we, we, we approach that decision uh, using the best information we have and reasoning and common sense. And, you know, the, as operating in, in sort of this, uh, again, um, more humanistic kind of way, even though we're walking in the spirit, you know, we might say, well, we can't, we can't do that. It just, you know, it doesn't make sense. Well, someone with a gift of faith might know, wait a minute, it, you know, I, we understand that we're supposed to be, you know, dealing with situations with rationality. It's not, you know, that we just, you know, completely fly by the seat of our pants, but a person with faith, God might have shown them, wait a minute, I'm going to do that. Uh, you know, and, and this, this touch of the Spirit or this confidence, then, then they would communicate to the people perhaps making the decision, or maybe it's one of those people that are making the decision that get this, and it's like, hey, you know, I know God is going to do this. And, and that would be, again, a, a, a manifestation of the Spirit uh, coming out of faith that God's placed on their heart. Next gift he talks about is the gift of healing. I got to say, we need this gift so desperately. And I think it's, it's one of those gifts that, um, you know, one of two things seems to happen. One is that uh, it, it just doesn't seem to be manifested much uh, in, in the body of Christ. Or sometimes people that I think maybe legitimately have this gift, they turn it into a circus. And, uh, and, and we... You know, we're, we're sitting here talking about people that are uh, in our congregation that are they're sick and, you know, and, and we need God to touch them and heal them. And some people have been given uh, gifts of healing. My hunch is that some of you have this gift. Uh, you've maybe never uh, attempted to exercise it or use it. But, but this is a gift that when a person um, prays for another person that is sick or injured, that there is divine intervention that takes place and that person is healed. And it was, again, it was in the first century, it was certainly a part of the life of the early church and God, you know, unleashed this. You know, some people feel like that in our day that this would be more along the lines uh, that this gift would be manifested by people, uh, doctors and nurses and those that, you know, that, that care for others. My sense is that a person that is drawn in that direction um, and wants to be engaged in the healing process potentially has this gift along with their training. And so that, you know, the best of all possible worlds and, 
And there are places where you can go where uh, doctors will treat you medically, but they'll pray for you too, and they'll pray for healing. And I, I feel like in our times that there, there's probably this kind of a combination that goes on, but certainly uh, it, it's a tremendous need within the body of Christ these days. And, and hopefully it would be my prayer that God would stir in the hearts of any of you that have this gift uh, that we could begin to, you know, uh, allow you to exercise that in praying for people that have physical needs. The gift of miracles. And again, this is uh, where God, uh, you know, um, overrides the natural processes that normally uh, operate in our world. And the word, the, the little phrase is actually works of power. And so God touches people with this ability to, uh, to power or ch- kind of channel the power of God and, and produce a God-given effect. Jesus was doing this all the time, obviously. You know, water to wine, that would be a miracle. I mean, there was, you know, what, what, as, as Jesus, you know, prayed for the water, uh, God completely changed the entire chemical structure of what was in you know, the, uh, uh, the, the jar there, and it, it became wine. And again, there tended to still be, after the time of Christ and throughout at least the first century, you would see this happening. And, you know, I, I look at all of these and think we so desperately need all of the gifts to be operating. So miracles, a, a gift of the Holy Spirit at times given to people. Um, prophecy, we've already looked at, but again, uh, This is that gift that's given where someone speaks forth the word of God under the inspiration and the motivation of the Holy Spirit. And then uh, this gift, discernment of spirits. And this is a spiritual gift where a person is given the ability to to be able to judge in certain situations uh, what's operating here. Is what's operating simply a, uh, a human dynamic uh, or is this an act that God's Spirit is at work? And um, let, let's just say that someone says, I have a message from God. And let's say they give that message. Someone with the discernment of spirits would probably be able to respond by either saying, you know, I, I, I believe that is from God. Uh, other times, someone that is exercising this gift might say, you know, time out. Something is not right here. You know, I, I'm, I'm sensing that something, that this isn't from God. Now, this gets messy, by the way, obviously. And I think that the, the, the early church was probably a little messier than what we're normally used to because there's kind of these dynamics, you know, going on. But, but the, and sometimes a person might say, you know, I believe that that's from the devil. There's this discernment of where is this coming from? Is it human? Is it godly? Or is it, is it dynamic? It's kind of interesting. I was thinking this week as I was working on this. Um, a number of years ago, um, Allison had been working in India uh, on behalf of the untouchables. And uh, Baker and I took a trip to India uh, to see you know, what she was doing and to meet some of the people there in India. And we were in a little town, well, a little town. We were in a town probably most of you have never heard of, Lucknow in India. It's about the size of Denver, so it's not really a little town. But again, you know, most of us aren't real familiar with the geography of India. But we had heard about uh, this event that was taking place. Some of you have heard me tell part of this story uh, called An Audience with the King. And what was going on, and we went out to see this. What was going on was that, uh, you know, a couple of years before we were there, Uh, There was a Catholic priest that had a Christian ashram, which is kind of a little retreat center, and he had sent out word into his community saying, um, I'd like to pray for you. Come and I'll pray for you. And people began to come to be prayed for. And and they began to come to faith in Jesus Christ because obviously most of the people in the community uh, were Hindus. And, and this began to grow and more people began to come. And he said, and finally got to the point where he said, well, maybe we ought to do a little music with this, you know, and have a little worship time. So they had a little worship time. And then, and then he decided, well, maybe we ought to, you know, toss in a message too. I mean, this is beginning to look a lot like a Sunday service, but it kept growing and growing and growing. And by the time we had got there, 
Um, we're driving out to where this event's going to take place. It was 15 miles away from where we were staying, and the roads were filled with people walking some 15 and 20 miles to get to what was basically this worship experience. And on the morning we were there, it was a, I think it was 102 degrees out. Uh, it was extremely hot. It was out in the middle of a field, and there were probably roughly around 10,000 people that had come to this audience with the king. Well, part of what had happened as this thing began to, uh, uh, to grow is that a lot of people uh, that were coming for prayer uh, were coming to be delivered from demons. And, uh, and it was sort of a weird deal for me, I've got to say, because we were in the worship service, and, uh, and I was sitting with some, some guys there from, I think, OM, Operation Mobilization, and they're, they're sort of interpreting for me what's going on there. Well, the band is singing a song. Well, I don't know what they're singing. And all of a sudden, all of these women began to come, come forward. And, uh, and, and the guy next to me just sort of nonchalantly said, oh, the, these are the demon-possessed women. And, uh, and, I'm, and, and I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, they're, they're singing. What they're singing is they're, they're singing and challenging uh, the demons in these women, and they're coming forward to get deliverance. And, and I, you know, I mean, this is a little foreign, you know, to me. And I said, well, how, well, how come it's all women? Because I'm thinking, please, Lord, don't have me get up there. You know, I'm like, a, I'm like really worried at this point, you know. And, uh, and he said, well, in Hinduism, oftentimes women open themselves up and invite the goddess to come and inhabit them. And when they do that, what they're really doing is they're opening themselves up to demonic forces, and many uh, Hindu women have, have this problem. Well, the Catholic priests didn't know what to do with these people that were coming to get prayed for, for, you know, deliverance from demonic spirits. And so he went out, and, uh, and I, don't, I don't know exactly how the connection was made, but he began to invite and team up with a Pentecostal exorcist. Now, can you see this deal? I mean, can you imagine this in America? Catholic priest, Pentecostal exorcist, you know. And so, uh, so, th- so this guy came along, and he began to pray for people for deliverance uh, in these situations. And, but what happened was, is that it, it got to be so many women were coming, and part of what they began to recognize is that some of these women were not demon-possessed. Some of these women were, were mentally ill. And, and they couldn't distinguish, is, is this demonic or is it mental illness? So the two of them then brought in kind of an evangelical Christian counselor person that had spiritual gifting uh, that was able to kind of meet and begin to discern what's going on here. Is this demonic or is this someone that needs help with mental health? Well, that's what the discernment of spirits would look like. It's someone that, that has a God-given gift and ability to look into a situation and say, this is demonic, or this is simply humanistic, or yes, this is something that, that's coming from God. It, it was quite, quite an experience to, uh, to watch all this going on. Uh, by the way, oh, I, no, I'm not going to tell you that. Anyway, um, so discernment of spirits, an uh, important gift, obviously. And again, think about this. They don't have the Bible yet. Now, I think this gift is still given, but imagine it operating in the first century where they're gathering together and people are saying, I've got a word from the Lord, okay? Well, uh, you know, John, in First John, he talks about testing the spirits. This is kind of what goes on here. So again, in the context of, of the worship experience, if someone says, I have a word from God, again, someone with the discernment of spirits could either say, it's valid, or hey, that's not coming from God. So again, particularly, I think, maybe in their environment, it was, it was a very important gift that uh, still is important, obviously. Um, then it comes the gift, ooh, you know what, of tongues. Uh, the gift of tongues, and it, it, you could translate this languages. Uh, the word glossa in the Greek that appears here in the text uh, literally or literalistically means tongues, but in the sense of a language, you know, not just the physical tongue. And, and this was a, a gift that was given where a person had the ability to speak 
in a language that they had never learned. A classic example of this is the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit, it, it comes upon the disciples there, and, uh, and, and uh, the sound of the rushing wind and, and this phenomena of tongues of fire coming to rest on them, a crowd has gathered to find out what's going on. It's taking place at Pentecost where literally Jews from all over the world have come to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. And I think there's, when you look at the book of Acts, I think there's 15 different language groups mentioned there. Um, Tom, you probably know some, something like that. Uh, and, and what happens is that they hear these guys these Jews that have never learned any of these languages, they hear them speaking the wonders of God in their own language. So on the day of Pentecost, it was known languages that were being spoken, and people from these countries uh, heard that, and it was part of what God used to, to bring them to faith in Jesus Christ. This is a gift that seems to have two uh, specific kinds of uses. One is that particular use where it's known language spoken uh, and, and the, the hearer uh, knows the language and gets the message from God. Then there's, there seems to be, uh, and the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians is all about this, that there is a, uh, um, a, a, a way in which this, gr this gift can be used privately in terms of a, a gift that when it's exercised privately, oftentimes in prayer, uh, actually ha has a, uh, an edifying uh, effect upon the person speaking in the language. And it would appear that oftentimes those are not known human languages. Paul makes the statement in chapter 13, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels. Now, is it possible that there's angelic languages and that the person that is uh, experiencing this gift and speaking uh, in an unknown language, that it's not actually human language? And I, you know, I, you know I've got to say, I think so. I think, that's, I think that's possible. And of course, again, when we looked at uh, the theological positions about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, if you, if you land over more on the Pentecostal side of that spectrum, then this gift becomes a gift that has to manifest itself in order to evidence the fact that you've now been filled with the Holy Spirit. And again, oftentimes, I think in modern times, when that gift is manifested, it, it does not appear to be known languages, that it, it appears to be you know, something else uh, and again, perhaps languages of, of angelic beings or, you know, something we, don't, we, just, we just don't know. Obviously, this is another one of those gifts that if you're on the other side of the spectrum, kind of the dispensational side of things, you believe is no longer given. And so whatever's happening over on this other side, if you're over here on the dispensational side, you, you think this is not authentic can't be authentic because the gift is not being given, and that's why those two positions tend to clash, clash quite a bit. By the way, the... Uh, oh, this is the rest of that text, by the way. Let, let me just read it real quick. So here's Pentecost again. Now they're staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven, and when they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Now, Jumping again, uh, th this is over to what is it, why, what is the biblical uh, sort of explanation for those that think that some of these gifts have ceased? And oftentimes they'll point to 1 Corinthians 13, which sits right in the middle of 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14. You kind of see how that, that works? It's 13s in the middle. We, we, you know, we hear it at weddings uh, all the time. It's actually written to the church because these guys can't get along together, okay? So he's, he talks about spiritual gifts, but then at, as he, in the midst of it, he says, but I'm going to show you, eagerly desire spiritual gifts, but let me show you a more important thing, a better way. And then he articulates the love chapter. So again, if I speak, in, and again, so think about this, because the context spiritual gifts. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I don't have love, what? I'm just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And so love is way more important 
than, than the gifts, and the Corinthians needed to learn that. We probably need to learn it too. So, the uh, gift of tongues. Now, along with that then, a gift is given called the interpretation of tongues or, or languages, and this is a gift that has the ability to understand what's being spoken uh, with the gift of tongues, understand without knowing the language, if it is you know, a known human language, but knowing what the message is. And so what's going to happen here is God is going to bring these two gifts together to give a message to the body of Christ as they're together engaged in worship. And, but the way it's going to happen is one person is going to give, you know, get the gift of you know, the, the message in tongues that they don't understand at all, and another person is going to receive the interpretation of that and they don't know the language, but they know what it is that's being said by the person speaking in tongues. And so they then are able to explain what the message is. Um, in chapter 14, by the way, part of uh, apparently what was happening uh, in Corinth is that in public worship, where outsiders were coming in, um, this gift was being exercised and what Paul says is if somebody comes in from the outside and you're, you're all speaking in tongues, they're just going to think you're nuts. You know? so, and so he says, don't use the gift of tongues if there isn't interpretation. And so if someone is speaking and no one's getting the interpretation, the person that thinks they've got a message from God, maybe they do and someone's not responding to it, but they just have to quit. Because it's not something that simply is to be used, um, you know, in a way where outsiders would just think, you know, these guys are crazy. It's interesting, by the by the way. Okay, uh, I, I'm actually I know I'm going to get done here. You know, when I was looking up and researching the Azusa Street revival that we talked about, uh, in the information I found, it also had some of the articles from the Los Angeles Times about the Azusa Street revival, and the articles were not very flattering. Let me just say this. They basically said, this, these people are all nuts, you know, and people were, you know, I mean, this is where the term holy roller came from, because people were falling down and kind of thrashing uh, uh, under, uh, if you're in a positive sense, if you believe it was God doing that, then under the... Uh, influence of the Holy Spirit, they were kind of losing, losing control. Uh, and, and this is kind of what Paul is indicating. Um, you know, in our own day, I have to be so careful on this because I really am open to all this. I really, I really do, but sometimes I, I just don't get it. Uh, you know, one of the major revival in our own times uh, that people flocked to like crazy, uh, when you'd walk in, people were, all, they were barking like dogs, and kind of, again, a, sort of an uncontrolled kind of a deal. I don't know what to do with that, honestly. I mean, I'm just telling you, I don't know what to do with it. You know, maybe it's the Lord, uh, and maybe it's, you know, a humanistic response to what God's doing. Maybe it's authentic, maybe it's not. But at least what Paul is saying is that, you know, things are to be done in order. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet, the person that has the gift of tongues can control whether they speak or don't speak. But again, if that gift is manifest in the context of the worshiping community, then there has to be interpretation. And then uh, the last then of the uh, manifestation gifts, the gift of administration, sometimes kind of connected with the gift of leadership. But this is a, this is a gift where a person is given that uh, kind of a special ability to organize and guide the community, uh, again, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Kind of Act 6. Act 6, what we do see is, again, we talked about this, that, you know, that um, they're having problems with you know, waiting on tables, serving meals. Some widows aren't getting served. Others are getting more than they should be getting. And, and you know, and the apostles say, we shouldn't be dealing with this. Uh, we shouldn't be waiting tables. And then they said, we'll find seven men full of faith in the Holy Spirit. And that becomes the first group of deacons. Will somebody organize that? And, and we don't quite see who that was. I mean, the idea, the idea was, let's find these people 
But then someone had to come along and say, okay, I'm gonna, we're going to go find them, we're going to organize them, and we're going to tell them what they need to do, and that would be what a gift of administration does. And again, balance in all of this, I pointed this out uh, last week, but again, you, you know, on the one hand, you have prophecy, which is somebody, you know, you know, which speaking forth the word of God and, uh, you know, powerful stuff, and, but then you got the gift of serving, someone that is, you know, giving their life uh, simply uh, trying to meet the needs of the body of Christ, and they're just absolutely as important, uh, you know, serving as important as prophecy. Uh, teaching, here's what the Word says, balanced out by exhortation. Here's how you need to put that into practice. And so, beautiful, faith, God can do this, I know God can do this. But somebody then has to administrate that happening. So you got faith and you got administration. And, and boy, you get those two guys in a room together that don't understand that's what the gifts are. They're never going to get along, okay? Because they just think completely different about, about the, uh, all of this. So anyway, so why it's important. So then, uh, so those are, the, those are the manifestation gifts, 10 manifestation gifts. Finally, in Ephesians chapter 4, we have what are called the equipping gifts. These are really offices uh, within the body of Christ. Uh, So it's a little different than the way the other gifts are communicated in Corinthians and Romans. But four equipping gifts, and that uh, kind of title comes from the text in in Ephesians 4, where it lists these four apostles, prophets, evangelists, and it's four or five, depending on whether it's a pastor, teacher, or pastors and teachers. That's a whole grammatical Greek semantic thing that you kind of flip a coin on, but, but the important point is, well, what are the, what's the function of these offices within the body of Christ? And it's this, for equipping the saints for the work of service to build up the body of Christ. When you come here on a Sunday, you're the ministers, okay? Your primary ministry, what, you know, even if it doesn't look like Ron, something very organized, your primary ministry is your life. It's you, And so, again, the more you grow and mature spiritually, the more effective you're going to be simply in living your life in a way that accomplishes the plans and purposes of God. And and the, the role of the equippers are to help you grow and mature spiritually. As a matter of fact, it's almost defined in the next verse, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature person to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. And this was a huge concern of Paul's, by the way. As a matter of fact, Colossians 1.28, great text, I don't think I don't have it up this morning, but Paul really, in a very brief time, tells exactly what his intentions are in ministry, and it's all giftedness, by the way. We proclaim him which is the gift of an evangelist, sometimes the gift of an apostle, because if you're proclaiming in a place where no one has ever heard before, that's an apostolic ministry, but it also might be evangelistic. We proclaim him, and then what does he say? Teaching and admonishing, those are two spiritual gifts. The gift of teaching, the gift of exhortation. So proclamation, evangelism, apostleship, teaching, uh, exhortation. Why? Uh, We teaching and admonishing everyone with all wisdom in order that we might present everyone complete or mature in Christ. And again, so, you know, the role of the equipper is to help you become more uh, uh, mature in your spiritual life. So four quick gifts, uh, and you see those in Ephesians down there. Actually, this little graph mentions splits pastor and teacher and splits them up. But, you know, again, very, very briefly, um, apostle, the one that's sent forth uh, to take the gospel into unreached areas. Today, that would be probably a missionary gift, taking uh, the message to areas that still have never heard. Um, After the apostle, the evangelist, we're all called to share our faith. Some people have a very unique God-given ability that when they share their faith, people actually come to faith. And uh, Bill Fay, great example, Ron. I mean, Bill was a guy that everywhere he went, people were just coming to Christ. You know, Rich Beach, my spiritual mentor. I mean, everywhere we went, 
you know, I mean, you'd be sitting there at lunch laughing. The waitress would come up, and it was kind of like, hey, have you ever heard of the four spiritual laws? And I mean, everywhere we went, people were coming to Christ. And I'd try and do that, and nobody was coming to Christ. <laughs> nobody was coming to Christ, you know. And, uh, but Rich was an evangelist. You know, Billy Graham, great example. On a mega scale, Billy Graham. Uh, I, I've told the story of going to Billy Graham crusade after first coming to Christ. I'd never listened to Billy Graham in my life. I had no interest in listening to Billy Graham. I'm at this crusade. Billy Graham's up there. He's giving this message. I'm thinking, I'm sitting by Rich Beach. I'm thinking, Rich is a lot better than this guy. You know, I mean, Larry, this is what I'm thinking. You know, this guy's not that great. And then he gives this altar call, and I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be very embarrassing, you know, because, you know, it wasn't like this great. And all of a sudden, people just start flooding up to receive Christ. And suddenly I'm realizing, oh, this is what the gift of evangelism looks like. So for some people, it's one-on-one, and it's not, you know, not a big deal. Others, it might look like a big deal, but it's a gift, a gift to, uh, to really clearly present the claims and the result, people come to faith. And then the final gift, pastor teacher or pastor and teacher, simply one that's been gifted to provide for the spiritual needs of the flock under them by leading, feeding, and protecting those under their care. Now, let me just close by saying this. Is this an exhaustive list? Probably not. There's probably other gifts. You know, for instance, Old Testament, there were gifts of craftsmanship. There were gifts of artistry to be able to, you know, produce, you know, the the furnishings there in the temple. Probably not, but what we do know is that all of us have one or more of these. And again, the big takeaway is simply this, that God wants us to discover and develop and deploy our spiritual gifts, whatever they are. And uh, so next week, we'll kind of look a little bit at how do I figure out what my gifts are. Let's pray. Father, um, thank you that you have given us gifts. And Lord, forgive us when we uh, um, don't appreciate that enough to try and figure out what they are or to, uh, to use them, even when we do have some kind of a sense. We just wanna, we want to be men and women that you can manifest yourself through Lord Jesus. And we know that oftentimes, along with simply loving on people and serving people and uh, sharing with them good news, that oftentimes it, it involves exercising these gifts and that when we do, you use them to bless people. And uh, you use them as uh, vehicles of your grace into the lives of others. So, Lord, we, we just want to know what, you know, show us what our gifts are and help us figure out how to use them more effectively, uh, both here at Highline and in our ministry that you have called us to in the city and in the world. In your name, Jesus, amen.